Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Cody Miller Show. Happy Monday morning. Thank you all for joining me today as we talk about all the things flowing through the world of swimming. That's racing, training, breaking stories, news, whatever you want to talk about. Some non-swimming related stuff as well. That's what we're here to talk about. And guys, I've had a pretty crazy week um, in all almost seven years of being with Allie. We have never taken a vacation during Allie's fall break. So Allie is a school teacher, as a lot of you know, and she has a fall week-long break in October, as I'm sure a lot of the young people out there know. And we've never taken a vacation during this break, and we're finally doing it. Um, as you're watching this right now, airing on Monday, Allie and I are on our way to Hawaii. So we're going on, we're going to Hawaii for a vacation. Um, and I'm actually doing two swim clinics the following weekend. So we've got five days of vacation. And then the next couple days after that, I do some swim clinics. But we're really, really excited to go to Hawaii. Allie's never been. I've never been. I'm ready to do some snorkeling. I'm ready to do some cliff jumping. I'm ready to do like, you know, I'm ready to have like a fun vacation. It's, it's going to be a good time. And we've had a crazy week. Um, I traveled a few days ago. I traveled out to North Carolina and I spoke at the USA Swimming Swimposium banquet event for North Carolina Swimming. That was like a ton of fun. Um, I did a little swim clinic there. And then funny thing, that morning I woke up at 4 a.m. I went to the airport, which I'm pretty close to. I flew to North Carolina. I did my whole day's work there. Then that night I flew to Denver and then by the time I got to my hotel room that night, it was like 2 a.m. Denver time, which was basically 4 a.m. this time. So I was up for like 24 hours straight, um, which I hadn't done in a while. Like not complaining, you know, like it was a fun weekend, but I was tired. And then on, on Sunday, um, I did a swim clinic with a Denver team and then I came home. And so I've been traveling a lot and we've got more stuff, more stuff on the horizon that I'm excited about. Um, I've been swimming with the boys regularly. That's been a ton of fun. Um, so yeah, things in the Miller household are going well. We've been having a lot of fun. And now let's go ahead and dive into these main topics, guys. Enough about me. Let's talk about what you wanna talk about. So how do I come up with the topics for this show? It's really easy. You create the topics. Whenever you, the audience, comes across a topic, subject, or question that you want answered on my show, fire me an email to CodyMillerShow at gmail.com. That's CodyMillerShow at gmail.com. And you might possibly see your topic or question answered on my show as a main topic. And without further ado, let's dive into this. And our first main topic of the day comes to us from Hugo from Rome. And Hugo writes, Cody, thank you so much for being you. Your swimming content pulled me back to the pool after 15 years off, and I'm happier than ever. Bless you, and thank you. My question is about Team USA swimmers getting paid. You mentioned in a previous episode that there's no salary for US national team athletes, which is crazy to me, I can't imagine. So how do those amazing athletes make money? Really hope we get your insight. Keep on crushing it, thanks. All right, thank you for that question, Hugo. And yes, I'm not sure if it was last week or the week before, but I did a segment on how US national teamers don't get a salary. Basically, it was the benefits of being on the national team, what you get. And there's a handful of things, but I mean, you get offered really good health insurance, you get travel expenses covered and some reimbursement. Um, and there's some other stuff as well, but there's no salary for being on the US national team. I also covered in that video how to make the US national team, right? Top six swimmers in all Olympic events in the United States. I mean, that's, that's just the bulk of it. But how do these athletes make money? How do these athletes get a salary? Well, there is an opportunity for that through USA Swimming. And that comes through what we call APA, which stands for Athlete Partnership Agreement. Every year, USA Swimming has around 50 slots for APA, which means you get paid to train as a professional. I believe it's tied with the IOC, the uh, or the the USOC, the uh, Olympic Committee. I'm not exactly sure where the funding comes from. I'm sure we could find that, but that's neither here nor there. Here's how it works: If you are ranked top 16 in the world in an Olympic event, you can qualify for APA, and you sign a contract with USA Swimming. And that contract basically means that you are training to better your position in the world. You are training to make big Team USA trips like the Olympics. 
and you have to provide USA Swimming with a calendar list of like the events you're going to compete in, um, uh, basically a write-up of your training plan and how you plan to get there and all this stuff. Um, and then you sign the contract and in exchange, you also as an athlete have to do a certain number of appearances and events for USA Swimming. A lot of times those are speaking events or meet and greets or you know autograph sessions at, at a meet that USA Swimming is hosting. There's a long list of things, but it's really pretty minimal. There's really not a whole lot of obligation on the athlete's part. Now, APA is fairly substantial. If you're top 16 in the world and you qualify for APA as an American athlete, depending on the year, depending on how much money they have, it's anywhere from 30 to $40,000, which, you know, is a, a fairly minimal salary, but it's a salary. It's a salary. I'll never forget in 2014 when I first qualified for APA. And that was a life changer because for me, transitioning out of college, I didn't have any money, had no money. And my first six months of training as a pro, I had to detail motorcycles, wash cars, self, like I had to really scrap and claw to make money just to pay rent. And then when I finally broke into the top 16 in the world and qualified for APA, like that money allowed me to just, you know, as a kid that just lived in an apartment with a bunch of roommates right out of college, I didn't have a lot of expenses. So that 40 or $35,000 was life changing, life changing. Um, and now the way that they select um, APA, it's like I said, everyone who is depending on the year, it's top 16 in the world, your world ranking. Sometimes if they have less money, it, it's been top 12. Like sometimes the year before the Olympics, like 2023 or, or what was 2019, you would have to be top 12 in the world to qualify for APA. Um, there are relay opportunities as well for a fraction of the funding. Say you're a relay swimmer, say you're fourth place in the country in the 200 meter freestyle, um, then you can qualify for some percentage of what the APA payment would be. Um, and there have, been, there have been times when athletes um, qualify top 16 in the world, but there's so many Americans that are top 16 in the world that some people don't get that funding. And then the decision as to who gets that funding comes, comes down to where you rank in the top 16, right? Like what, what events are you? Um, I think it was 2019, I was 15th in the world in one of the breaststroke events, and I didn't make APA. Although that year they said, if you were top 16 in the world, you make APA, that's the benchmark. But they had that year USA Swimming had so many people in the top 12 in the world that they ran out of funding. And then actually to give USA Swimming a lot of credit, those athletes that were top 16 in the world, like myself, at that year, I think Ryan Lochte was also a guy who was maybe 15th in the world and one of the IMs. Um, they then went out and found some funding for us. It wasn't the full amount, but it was something. So they do their best, like they do try and help the athletes. but. To answer your question, Hugo, there is an option to get a salary for U.S. national teamers, but it's completely predicated on your world ranking, and it's it's hard because you know a lot of swim a lot of swimmers train year round, and they only have a handful of meets where they really peak. Right, you might only have three meets a year where you fully shave down, fully taper, and really hit a time that would put you in like the top 16 in the world. And if you have a bad year, or you have one bad long course season, sometimes that could be it. You know, and it's it's heartbreaking. It's happened to me. Like I've missed APA by just a smidge before. Um, I know a number of athletes that have. But yeah, there is that option. So that's essentially how that works. It's an agreement that you 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 go into a contract with USA Swimming. There's not a whole lot of obligation on the athlete's part other than to prove that you're actively training, actively trying to get better, and you're on the war path to trying to make the Olympics and represent Team USA. Um, and then they provide that for you. So that's how that works. Thank you for that question, Hugo. I hope that helps. If anyone has any more interest in that, like you can just Google athlete partnership agreement and I'm sure you'll find the athlete break. Wait, let me find this real quick. Yeah, it's like right, I mean, right there, right there. You just, you can find it. It's on swim time. So anyway, thank you, Hugo, for that question. And now let's move on to topic number two. And topic number two today comes to us from Anthony from New Mexico. And Anthony writes, hello, hello, Cody. I'm a big fan, I'm a big swim fan looking at the upcoming major swimming competitions. The 2022 short course swimming world championships hosted by Australia is coming up and I have a few questions. How does USA Swimming select this team of athletes? In years past, it looks as though most major Team USA stars don't compete in this event. What's up with that? Do they care? Can we get your thoughts on this? 
Thank you. P.S. You are my favorite YouTuber. All right. Thank you, Anthony, for that question. And yeah, the big meet coming up right now, Short Course Worlds being held in Australia. And Team USA is going to announce their roster probably within the next week. Um, and here's how their selection criteria works. And the USA Swimming has always done this way. Although this is a short course meters format competition, USA Swimming is selecting their athletes based on long course meters performances. And I'll explain why. Um, they will go down the list of all of the fastest long course times from the previous summer. Right, say the long course season ends August 31st, which is roughly the cutoff when we transition into short course. USA Swimming will look at from January 1 to August 31st, whoever has all those fastest times, they get offer spots first. And there's a criteria by which they do this. Let me pull this up. Okay, the first thing. So the first athletes that get offered spots on the short course world teams are swimmers with the first and second fastest times in the 50 and 100 freestyle. So they prioritize the 50 and 100 freestylers first because those athletes have the most opportunity to win medals for the team. If you are a 100 freestyler, not only do you get to swim the 100 freestyle individually if you're first or second place in the country in that event, you also get multiple relays, the four by 100 freestyle relay, the four by 100 mixed freestyle relay. Then you've got the medley relays. There's freestyle slots on those relays as well. The 4x50 medley relay, the 4x100 medley relay. Then you've got the mixed 4x50 medley relay, the mixed 4x, like, there's so many relays. So they prioritize those first because that's where the medals are at. The second, the second set of slots for the team gets offered to swimmers with the fastest times in each individual Olympic event other than the 50 and 100 free. So after they go 50 and 100 free, then they go, okay, the person with the fastest 100 breaststroke time. The firstest with the fastest tuner backstroke time. The person with the fastest hunter butterfly time. You guys, if those people, you know, you're next. Then after that, then they select the second fastest time in the 200 freestyle. Once again, for the relay purposes, because you've got the four by 200 freestyle relay. And then the fourth criteria is the second fastest time in each individual Olympic event other than the 50, 100, and 200 free. And they do that because they've already selected the freestyle spots. So now, they'll go for the second fastest tuner breaststroker, the second fastest tuner flyer. So that's kind of their criteria. And USA Swimming is sending a team of 16 men and 16 women. And a lot of time, a lot of the times, if you go back years and years and years, Team USA, it's, it's not what you would consider their A-list team. It's not all of their best, best athletes. A lot of, a lot of US, high-level US national team swimmers don't go to short course worlds um, for various reasons. A lot of them just want to prioritize long course. Um, a lot of them, you know, whatever. There's, there's, there's a lot of reasons. Um, but last year, there was a lot of scrutiny for USA Swimming's decision to choose their short course world championship team based on long course times because the last few years we have had the ISL. So typically speaking, Americans don't do a lot of short course meters racing. They just don't. But last season, obviously with ISL season three, we had a lot of Americans putting up the fastest times in the world or some of the fastest times in the world in these short course mirrors events. Most notably, Coleman Stewart set the world record in the short course meter 100 backstroke at the ISL, which was a dope race, by the way. You should totally check it out. It was sick. So he sets the world record, but because he's not first place or second place long course on the Americans list from that year, he didn't get invited. Like the world record holder in this event that just got, just set the record, doesn't get invited, didn't get invited to the team. That was a big deal. You've also got someone like, like Abita Nelson, who is by the way, an awesome female American swimmer. One of the top backstrokers in the world, short course, didn't get invited. So there are, and, and this happens all the time, right? This, this isn't something new. It was just so glaringly obvious because we had had more short course meters competitions for the Americans to swim. But USA Swimming prioritizes the Olympics. That's it. That's why they select these teams based on long course performances. Also, we don't, we don't, I mean, they, the argument could be made, they could host a short course meters trials, like we could have a trials. I think it would be cool if we had a trials, It'd be more racing, more opportunity. They should do that. But the thing is everything USA Swimming does operating on the quarterly, what we call the quad basis, a four-year basis. Everything that they do is to benefit that Olympic team. Everything that USA Swimming does is to benefit the long course format. So 
a lot of times they'll offer, or not a lot of times, all the time, they offer those slots to people who have performed long course to give those people more international experience. They prioritize those long course swimmers. And a lot of times the great short course swimmers just get left behind and don't make certain teams. And that's just kind of a sad reality that we live in. And I wish that that would change. I wish that they would have a short course world's trials right before. I, I really, a lot of countries do that. Lots of countries do that. Um, but then the argument against that is like, look at the last couple of short course worlds. The Team USA has still topped the medal, medal count. I think we had like 30 medals at the last short course worlds. Like nine of them were gold. So it's like, well, what, what, do, we, what do you do here? You know, what do you do? I, 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 I'm just in favor of more, more meets, more opportunities, more trials. I'm in favor of that kind of thing. But anyway, that's how that works. That's how USA Swimming selects their teams. It's based on long course times. There's a lot of controversy around it about should they or shouldn't they do it this way, but that's how it works. I hope that that answers your question and it will be interesting to see um, who is on that short course world team. Um, I know a number of athletes that are going, some, some top American athletes that aren't, but it'll be fun to watch. I'm, I'm excited to see how that goes. All right, thank you for that question, Anthony. And now let's move on to topic number three. And this is a good one. And topic number three today comes to us from Tommy from Alabama. And Tommy writes, Good day, Cody. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on Shane Cassis's quadrathlon results from the University of Texas. I know these results are several weeks old now. I was just blown away by how impressive Shane's swims actually were. I think he has a bright future on Team USA. Is this something you talk about for the show? I hope so. Your YouTube channel is the best. Have a great week, thanks. All right, thank you, Tommy, for that submission. And yeah, let's talk about this. A few weeks ago, I was asked the question, who is the next big Team USA stud that is popping off that the general American audience like doesn't really know of yet, right? That maybe hasn't made an Olympic team yet. And my answer was Shane Cassis. This dude is on fire. And yeah, we can go ahead and, and talk about this because this is really cool. Um, you know, a lot of teams do a quadrathlon. I think Eddie Reese may have started it at the University of Texas. Um, I know that the scoring system he created in like the 1980s and it's been the same ever since. And a lot of programs do this and it's really cool. And um, I actually made a vlog about this not too long ago. I competed in the Indiana University quadrathlon for fun. It was really cool. You can check that video out. In that video, I explain how, how it works, but it's essentially four 50s, one of each stroke, all suited race, and, and you just you go four 50s all out in a suit for time. Um, and there's a cool scoring system. And um, yes, Shane Cassis, oh my God, uh, had an amazing performance. Let me run through this times. This is obviously short course yards, so for my international viewers, you're just gonna have to learn yards here, guys. But he goes 20.550 fly, 20.750 backstroke, that's crazy, 24.750 breaststroke, and then 19.3, 50 freestyle. Those times are insanely fast. And um, he scored over 5,000 points, which apparently has never been done before which is really, really cool. So that is insanely, insanely cool. Uh, it's been really fun to watch this dude just explode. Um, not crazy surprising because watching his 200 IM last summer, I mean, Shane swam the 200 IM at US Nationals after World Championships and won the 200 IM. And he won the 200 IM in a 155.2, which was just a couple hundredths slower than what Leon Marchand of France went to win the World Championship gold medal, which is crazy. And Leon, I believe, is the best swimmer on the planet right now. And he's and, and Shane was right there. That's an event he didn't even swim at Worlds. And obviously, you know, Shane has been doing extremely well on the international stage. At the most recent short course world championships, he won the 100 backstroke. Um, at the most recent long course world championships, he won a bronze medal in the 200 backstroke. And now looking at his sprints, looking at all these, I mean, anyone who's followed college swimming here in America has seen how good this dude is. Um, he's still young. He's now training at the University of Texas. He went to Texas A&M. So I agree with you. I agree 
with Tommy that this guy, Shane, has a crazy bright future on Team USA. He's already winning medals. He's already doing really well. The question is like, how much better can he get? You know what I mean? And I don't like putting expectations on athletes. We as fans can speculate and talk about how, pe how people are gonna do this and that. But if you were to ask me who is one of the most likely people to qualify for the United States team in 2024, Shane has ample opportunity to do so. I think he's gonna be, I think he's gonna be on that team and he's gonna be in the hunt for a lot of medals. Um, and I am excited to see where things go. But if you're like a hardcore swim nerd, um, definitely get on Swim Swam and look at some of those races. Like somebody posted all of all of those 50s from that Texas um, quadrathlon meet and it's really cool to see. And those times this early in the season, very, very fast, very, very, very fast. So very, very impressive. So yes, super excited to see how Shane continues. Um, I'm assuming he's gonna compete at Short Course Worlds coming up. That's gonna be fun to watch. Um, yeah, so that's great. Thank you for that submission, Tommy. Definitely be watching out for him um, on the swim front. And now let's move on to topic number four. And topic number four comes to us today from Abdul from Saudi Arabia. And Abdul writes, good day, Mr. Miller. My favorite race of the 2021 Olympics was the men's 400 meter freestyle. Tunisia's Ahmed Hafanawi surprising gold medal performance brought great joy to millions of people. I was excited to see that Mr. Hafanawi joined your swim team at Indiana University. However, I recently read online that Mr. Hafanawi won't be competing for the Hoosiers this season. Can you elaborate on this situation and give us fans an update? Please and thank you, God bless. All right, thank you, Abdul, for that submission. And yes, Ahmed Hafanawi, what a swim. I agree with what you just said. One of the best races of the last Olympics was the men's 400 freestyle. So this kid, Ahmed, young guy, I mean, he's like 18 or 19 years old, goes into the Olympics ranked maybe 16th place in the 400 freestyle, maybe. Then in prelims, swims the best time, is seated eighth place going into finals. So he barely qualifies for finals. I think ninth place was like less than a tenth of a second or right around a tenth of a second behind him. So he almost didn't even make it into the final eight slots. Makes it in, swims the Olympic final out of lane eight, goes out like a banshee and hangs on and wins the gold medal for Tunisia. And it was insane. It was so, so, so cool. That was, that race, go look that race up on YouTube. After this, go look it up. It's awesome, okay? So a few months prior to Ahmed winning the Olympic gold medal, he committed to come and swim at the university, or here at Indiana University and get an education, right? He decided that after the summer games, regardless of how things were gonna go, he wanted to come to America he wanted to get an education and he wanted to train with an elite program. Ahmed trained by himself, like with his coach, by himself leading into that Olympics for like a year, which is insane. And anyone who's ever swam by themselves knows how hard that is. So he wanted to come to a team and he wanted to get an education. And yes, as you said, you just read that he will not be competing for the Hoosiers this season. That is true. Unfortunately, Ahmed did not meet the academic requirements to compete in the NCAA. So the schooling that he's been doing back at home wasn't sufficient for what need it needed to be to be eligible to compete. And that would have been the same at any university across the country. Unfortunately, sometimes this kind of things happen. You know, when he was living at home, training for the Olympics that Olympic year, they were obviously very much prioritizing swimming. Obviously that worked out really, really well, but school wasn't a high enough priority to make him eligible for this season. So he is here now, he's living here, he's at school, he's going to school. And you know, the thing is, yes, he's an Olympic champion. Yes, he's one of the fastest swimmers in the world, but he's still just a young guy um, dealing with the transition of moving to a new country, starting on a new team, um, prioritizing school, you know, obviously he can speak English, but he's he's working on his English, actively working on his English, and, and that's a shift. Any foreign swimmer that comes in knows that that's a challenge. You know, um, two of my really good friends, right, Yusuf and Marwan El Kamash, my Egyptian friends that you've probably seen in my videos, you've seen Yusuf all the time. Marwan is a world championship finalist level distance freestyler, 400, 800 mile, and so, um, Marwan has been training with Ahmed 
or with um, Ahmed, sorry. And um, and Yusuf is obviously um, been coaching. So they've been helping him along, you know, and, and he's doing great. But yeah, the answer to your question is he won't be competing on the college team until the following year. Like he can't even start in January. He's got to go a full year of schooling before he's eligible. But he will, Ahmed will be competing at Short Course Worlds this December. He will be competing at, I believe, a couple World Cup meets, like the one in Indianapolis here in just a few weeks. Um, and we'll see how he does. You know, Ahmed took a ridiculous amount of time off after the Olympics, more than he's ever taken before. Rightfully so. That's the right, that, obviously that's the right thing to do. So he's still just trying to get back into the swing of things, right? He's still just trying to get back into shape. However, that being said, I've seen him do some pretty amazing things in practice already. I've seen him do some pretty crazy stuff. I mean, I've seen the dude push like a 141, 200 freestyle in the middle of an aerobic set. And it wasn't even that hard. Like that, that once again, that's yards. So my international viewers, but it's pretty crazy. But I am really excited to see how he progresses. It's, you know, it's good for anyone to go to a place where you have people to actively push you. You might be the faster swimmer. You might have the best times. You might be ranked number one in the world, but you'll still have days where you're tired. You'll still have off days. And there's a great benefit to having other elite swimmers around you push you, especially on those off days. Because like I said, Ahmed trained by himself. And now he's got guys around him that can push him regularly. He's got Marwan that can push him. You know, we've got uh, Rafa um, from Germany. We've got the German record holder. Um, we've got a ton of guys that are very, very fast that will push him. And it's fun for me to see and fun for me to watch him. So I'm excited to see how he turns out. I'm really excited to see what he eventually goes when he does do some yards meets. I think it'll be crazy. Um, but yeah, thank you for that question. That's the update. Hope that answers your question. I will say it's extraordinarily rare for an international swimmer to do it, do really well at the Olympics and then decide to come to the, and then decide to continue and come to the United States and go through the NCAA system. We, we here in America get lots of foreign swimmers that come to swim in the NCAA to get an, Ameri an American education. Like that's normal, we see that all the time. But what Ahmed did was he decided he wanted an education, come and train here, and then won the gold medal, which undoubtedly opened up all of these doors for him, okay? All of these opportunities for him. And he and his family still made the decision to come here and do this after the fact. That is rare. A lot of times once someone sees that level of success, the roadmap changes. And it did. And that's really cool. You know, it's more common for Americans who do really well to then go into the NCAA system because that's more common, right? Like most notably Lydia Jacoby. I mean, she won the gold medal in the women's hunter breaststroke at the last Olympics. And then decided, you know, she's going to University of Texas. She's, you know, now swimming there. And so we see that kind of thing all the time. But it is really interesting from the from the international scene to come here because a lot of times they have more funding and financing opportunities and sponsorship opportunities and all this. Um, but now we have the NIL, which is great, which obviously benefits a lot of those athletes. So that's your update. Thank you so much, Abdul, for that question. And now let's move on to topic number five. And topic number five today comes to us from uh, Charlotte from Helen, Georgia. Charlotte from Helen, Georgia. And Charlotte writes, Hello, Cody. I'm a former breaststroker who loves to follow swimming. Did you see Matt Fallon's season opener 200-yard breaststroke last week? He swam a 152.33 at the University of Pennsylvania's inner squad meet. That's insane. After his swims last summer, and now this, I personally see him as a favorite to make the 2024 USA Olympic team. What are your thoughts? Thanks for all you do. Okay, thank you, Charlotte, for that question. And yeah, Matt Fallon, this dude has popped off. This dude, this dude is good. This dude is really good. So, first of all, 152.3 in the 200-yard breaststroke is a very fast time. That's a time that you would see at a mid-season meet in November out of some of the fastest breaststrokers in the country. And he just did it as his first swim. Now, I know that this was a suited swim, um, but still, that's, that's, it's crazy. Um, now, do I think that this guy is a favorite to make the 2024 Olympic team? Well, let's, let's get into this. So first of all, Matt has really popped off this last year. He got third place at the NCAAs in the tuner breast. He's been 149, 200 breast, short course yards, 149, zero. So he's really good. 
And then this past summer, he didn't compete at world championship trials. So he didn't even swim at the meet that would have put him on the world's team. I believe it was for schooling purposes. He had classes, there was some kind of conflict. So he didn't, he didn't compete in it. But then a couple months later, he goes to US nationals and wins the men's tuna breaststroke and goes 207.9, which puts him very high in the world rankings. That time also would have won United States World Championship Trials just several weeks prior, would have put him on the world's team. That time also would have qualified for the, for the American Olympic team just two years ago, I think. Like you, you go 207 and now you're in real contention of making an American Olympic team. So that's legit. So yes, Matt Fallon is legit. Now the question is how much better can he get, right? How much faster can he get? I don't know, but I'm very excited to see him swim. Would I say that he's the favorite to make the team, the Olympic team? Well, if you were to make a list of guys who are the most likely contenders, he's on that list. There's just a handful of guys, right? I mean, you've got Nick Fink, who is still hanging on, um, who went 208 this last summer, so he's, he's still swimming, so he's still in the game. Um, so how fast can he go? Who knows? And then you've got a lot of younger guys, right? right? You've got like a, a guy like a Josh Matheny, who I swim with, who trains here at Indiana, really, really good, and a handful of others. So that 200 breaststroke is an event that's absolutely up for grabs. It's one of my favorite events, one of my favorite events to watch. So Matt is certainly a major contender. Now, now everyone has his eyes on him. And now the question is, how is he going to respond with the big target on his back? Because now he is the number one American 200 breaststroker right now. You know what I mean? Right now. So... I'm very interested to see what he will go short course yards at his midseason meet coming up like several weeks from now. And then at the NCAA championships, like, you know, is he going to go 148, 147? That would be sweet. We'll see. And then the real question, what happens at world championship trials next summer? Can he make the world's team? Can he win ML? I'm rooting for the guy. I hope so. Because it's, it's really cool to see young up and comers do well and it's particularly cool because you know he's from an ivy league school and we don't very often see swimmers come out of the ivy leagues who go on to make u.s national teams and and make these big teams i mean it's it's few and far far between right um so um yeah i'm very 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 pumped thank you for that submission charlotte we'll keep an eye on matt it's a good breaststroker really really good breaststroker okay and with that out of the way let's move on to topic number six and topic number six comes to us today from Michael from Utah. And Michael writes, What up, Cody? You are the man. Wondering what your current thoughts are on HBO's House of the Dragon and Amazon's Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power TV shows. I am personally enjoying both, but I think Lord of the Rings has been better. I'm assuming you've watched, you've been watching both shows. What do you think? Thanks. Okay. Thanks for this submission, Michael. Yeah, now we're talking. Now we're talking. Let's get into the nerd stuff. I am a happy person. Like, if you are into, if you are into fantasy, if you are into fantasy, the fantasy genre, you're probably living your best life right now. I mean, look at look at all the stuff behind me. Obviously, I'm watching these shows. First of all, Game of Thrones, the House of the Dragon spinoff series, a lot of people super highly skeptical about. Rightfully so. The last season of Game of Thrones was very controversial. Not everyone loved it. I personally quite liked the last season of Game of Thrones. I think I'm in the minority. I actually really liked it, but I understand people's complaints, nitpicks, whatever. It was the biggest show of all time. Like, by a lot. By far the biggest show of all time. Its footprint in pop culture is massive. It's huge. I've actually got a Game of Thrones poster right there that I'm going to be putting up on the wall in that room soon. Um, so, people went into the show skeptical. And now we're seven episodes in and it's great. It's fantastic television. It's amazing. I mean, the thing with House of the Dragon is you don't even need to be a, a, a sci-fi, or sorry, not sci-fi. You don't need to be a fantasy nerd to love this because it's true political intrigue. It's succession and Yellowstone that just happens to take place in a world with dragons, right? It's all of the things that the characters are dealing with, the scheming, the backstabbing, all of that stuff happens in today's world. Once again, they're just, they just live in a world where there's like a little bit of magic. That's it. That's what makes the show so good. Like you can relate with all these characters. You know people that scheme like that. It's so good, guys. It's so, so, so good. I'm loving the show. Now, Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, I'm also loving, but man, it's been a slow burn. 
man, it's been slow. Like the first few episodes, I was like, where's the story going? Like, it's just, it's too slow paced. And I think it's really losing a lot of the general audience. Like I, I would have a hard time recommending a show like Rings of Power to someone that if you don't love the Lord of the Rings movies, like you're probably not gonna love this show, right? But you might not love fantasy, but you'll probably, you could probably still get into, into, into House of the Dragon. Um, now, which show is better right now? I think it's pretty easy to say that House of the Dragon has been a better show. Every episode has been good. It's been consistent. The pacing is quick. It never loses you. You're always wondering, like every every time a scene ends, you've got more information. Now you have more questions and the story progresses. Whereas with The Rings of Power, it's like you're learning about this wide sweeping epic world that is the Tolkien universe. You're meeting all these characters, but it's slow to progress. Like, and finally in episode six, whew, Mount Doom, baby. Mount Doom. Things finally happened. Episode six was the best episode. It was incredible, um, but it took a long time to get there. So I am enjoying it tremendously. I'm so excited to see where both these shows go. We have a few more episodes, um, but like I said, I think House of the Dragon has been better, but I greatly, greatly, greatly enjoy uh, the Rings of Power. I can't wait to finally see the rings get forged. Amazon has said that they're gonna do five seasons of the show. They're already working on season two right now, which is really exciting. Um, and you know, they're obviously taking a lot of liberties with the source material, which if you're a nerd, you're into like me, but whatever. But yeah, obviously I've said this before. The first thing Allie and I ever talked about was Lord of the Rings. And so now that there is a Lord of the Rings TV series put on by Amazon, the most expensive television show ever made, ever made by far, like by, by a lot. I mean, they, they've put $450 million into one season of television because they spent $250 million on getting the rights to make this show from the Tolkien estate. And they didn't even get all the rights, but which is a whole nother thing, which is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. But yeah, I'll wrap this up and just say I'm loving both shows. Um, if I if I had to recommend any show to anyone right now, it would be House of House of the Dragon. You have to have a strong stomach because there's a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of death and murder. There's a lot of sexual stuff. There's you know, you know like if, if you can deal with that, if you're an adult, you know, you don't have to be a fantasy nerd to like to love that kind of show. Whereas Lord of the Rings, if you are, you get into that too. So thank you so much for that question, Michael. I appreciate it. I love, I love talking to people about this kind of stuff. Um, you know, obviously I love talking to people about swimming, but when I, when I meet people um, and they start bringing up things like that, we go down some rabbit holes. We'll go down some deep rabbit holes and it's fun. So thank you for that. And okay guys, that's gonna wrap it up. That's, that's the wrap on today's show. Thank you so much for all the questions. I hope you all have a fabulous week. Once again, if you wanna get your, your question answered on my show, fire me an email anytime. It's totally free. We've got merch on the merch store. Check out CodyMillerNFT.com and get signed up because if you want to buy a ticket to a digital event to hang out with me, meet me on a Zoom call, ask me any question you want, swimming, non-swimming, racing tips, whatever, that is your opportunity. I've had a lot of people for a long time ask me about this. So we've set this up in the form of basically an NFT. What is an NFT? It doesn't matter. It's your digital ticket to do things with me. Like that, that's really what it is, okay? It's just the technology. Um, if you wanna submit me video footage of yourself racing, of yourself training, of your stroke work, you buy this package and I will create a very, very long, in-depth, super cool, awesome video for you, just for you that I'll send to you that we talk about. It's really cool. So that's gonna be available as well. Go to Cody Miller NFT to sign up for that now um, before the site goes live. That way, you know, that way you get notified so they don't sell out. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. As always, please hit that subscribe button. Um, new vlogs every single Wednesday. Um, if you'd like to book me for a swim clinic, I've got a few openings in January, a few weekends in January. Fire me an email, okay? Um, and yeah, that should do it, everyone. Have a fabulous week. Thank you for joining me. And until my next video, I will see you all later.